So, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Pacific Night 2014. Now, who here is warm? Because it's kind of warm in this place here, so I'm not going to keep you standing around for too long. Um, so, you've seen me and my, my friends, my colleagues of Hotafiti. I'll just share a few songs with you from Aotearoa, New Zealand. Um, and we look forward to, uh, to sharing some more stuff with you during the night. My name is Atta, I'm part of the group Hope Tafiti and I'm also serving as the MC for this evening. So this evening, uh, Pacific Night is hosted each year by the ambassadors and the representatives of the countries and states of the Pacific Islands Forum, the US Pacific Territories and Insular Areas. I'd now like to call upon the Dean of the Pacific Diplomatic Corps, the Ambassador of Palau, His Excellency Percy Kyoto, who will offer a few welcoming remarks. Thank you very much and uh, good evening everyone. Uh, the ambassador of New Zealand said you don't want to have the man stand, you don't want to stand between the man and his food, so I'm going to make this very brief. Uh, on behalf of the uh, ambassadors uh, here, Pacific ambassador here in Washington, Premier uh, representative in New York, and the other uh, territories uh, representatives, welcome to this uh, year's Pacific day reception. Uh, all of you who were here earlier uh, had an opportunity to hear the panel and, and, and so and heard the President of the Republic of Palau and the Foreign Minister of the Republic of Marshall Islands and also the Foreign Minister of the Federal State of Micronesia. So I just want to acknowledge their presence here and thank them for, uh, for, for coming here this evening. As you all know, Pacific Night is uh, at the end of the year, uh, about, about this time of the year. And uh, really, this is a Pacific way of, uh, of taking our friends in Washington and New York who devote their time to work on Pacific issues. I, I, I really don't have time to go over their names, but you know who you are. We thank you very much. It is also our way of giving back uh, to this great city of Washington for graciously hosting us. It is also our, our way of bringing Pacific Islands to you. It's not every day that you get to meet and, and, and visit 20 islands in the Pacific. So relax and enjoy yourself. And be, and meet them with each other and enjoy the Pacific Rim. Thank you very much. Wow, I think we have a uh, giant coming to give us some words. So at this time, ladies and gentlemen, it's my very, uh, it's my privilege to welcome to Pacific Night 2014, the United States Secretary of State, Mr. John Kerry. share Pacific Day. Uh, tonight we celebrate, obviously, or this evening, I guess I can still say, the critical uh, relationship that unites all of the nations of the Pacific. And believe me, in the last few days at our conference, we've seen 
the power of how united uh, the Pacific region is. So we thank you because these partnerships were uh, born out of a world that put us together geographically because we border on the Pacific, but it has also put us together because we have weathered wars and we have developed together and built a shared prosperity. So I want to thank uh, Palau's ambassador, Hersi uh, Kiota, who invited me uh, to come and speak. And I particularly want to thank New Zealand's ambassador, uh, Michael Moore, for hosting us. I think we all want to join together in saying thank you for, for joining us to do that. Oh, very exciting. Um, I want to recognize New Zealand's prime minister who is here. He's hiding over here, right here. John Key, thank you so much, Mr. Prime Minister. It's an honor to be here. And I'm going to be meeting with him uh, tomorrow where we can discuss uh, some of the issues that we'll talk about here. I also uh, am honored to be here with the president of Palau, uh, Tommy Rengan Sao. And we also met, we had a wonderful opportunity to talk about a host of issues, but most importantly, the way in which island nations are deeply threatened by uh, climate change, rising sea levels, acidification, overfishing. Uh, and all of these were the topics of the conference that we just had in the last few days. I want to just emphasize to everybody, America thinks of itself as a Pacific nation and is a Pacific nation proudly. We don't just border it and have an extraordinary coastline framing the Pacific, but we have been in the Pacific and in its far reaches for centuries. We also obviously went through an extraordinarily difficult uh, period uh, during World War II. Uh, we shed a lot of blood in the Pacific and fought hard for the ability of Pacific nations to be free, to determine their own future, uh, and certainly to be able to associate, come together to protect the freedom of navigation, uh, the freedom of commerce, uh, and our rights as human beings. And one of those rights is the right to be free from pollution that literally threatens nations. That is why President Obama made the strategic decision in the first term to do what has become known as a rebalance or pivot, but I prefer rebalance because pivot implies you're somehow turning away from something else, and we're not. But we're rebalancing so that we make certain that people in the Pacific understand our commitment and can rely on the presence of the United States with respect to many of those issues that I just talked about. Uh, President Obama is absolutely committed to continuing to uh, make certain that everybody understands this rebalance is not a passing fancy, it's not a momentary thing, and in fact, it has grown. We recently uh, renegotiated a long-term defense pact uh, with Japan. Uh, we have reaffirmed our relationship with uh, South Korea. We have, obviously, with ASEAN and our presence in Southeast uh, Asia, as well as throughout uh, the islands and, and uh, the nations southwards to New Zealand and Australia. Uh, we've strengthened our presence there. And we are continuing, uh, and we will continue, I can guarantee you, uh, to work to impress on people that the values that, that bring us together don't belong to one country, they don't belong to one nation. Uh, I would tell you that I think they are genuinely universal values, and they certainly don't belong to any ideology. There are a huge number of issues that Pacific nations have to wrestle with as a community now. And we all have a stake in regional stability and security. The right to choose one's own government, as I said, we believe is a birthright. Economic growth is imperative for all of us. But one thing above all looms as a threat, literally, to existence, and that is uh, the connective tissue that holds, uh, connects all of us with respect to the environment and our responsibility to the ocean itself. 
We've just had uh, two days of a conference in which speaker after speaker, film after film, expert after expert, scientist after scientist document the degree to which we, mankind, are threatening ourselves as a consequence of the amount of carbon dioxide we are releasing into the atmosphere, as a result of too much money chasing too few fish, as a result of the uh, devastating impact of pollution runoff from development that streams out of rivers and uh, down into the ocean so that we have over 500 dead zones. Uh, we can unfortunately boast a big one in the uh, Gulf of Mexico where coming out of the Mississippi River from the various rivers that feed into it along the way, all the way from the northern part of our country down into the south. We have runoff from agriculture, which overloads nitrates, which kills uh, the ecosystem. Uh, this is happening, unfortunately, everywhere. The numbers of birds and fish that are found imbibing plastic, which has a 450 year uh, life therefore obviously uh, a killer uh, for many fowl and fish. Uh, we face an extraordinary challenge to our fishing stocks almost everywhere. Some depleted, some stocks so low that they're almost extinct. And in some places, uh, fisheries that are fished to the level that they're near uh, the possibility of collapse. So, all of what I've just said is obviously an enormous challenge and probably some of you could walk away tonight and say, boy, I hate to hear all those facts because I don't know what I can do about it. Well, the problem is solvable. What is shocking to me, and I think to many of us who are engaged in this effort, is the fact that it's not something we can't do something about. The solutions are staring us in the face. The solution to climate change which we have to embrace rapidly because of the rate and pace at which coal-fired power plants are still being built, the solution is energy policy. And we have brave innovators and entrepreneurs that are on the cutting edge of producing alternative and renewable capacity to produce the energy that we need. Whether it's solar or wind or biomass or other forms or even some people say God perished the thought because of what happened in Japan. But if you don't build on an earthquake fault uh, and right next to the ocean, nuclear does have the ability, as we've seen in so many places, from France to the United States Navy, uh, where we haven't lost one sailor in more than 70 years of the use of nuclear power or have one accident on a ship. It is, because it is zero emissions, one of the alternatives we're going to have to use. And I'm confident that our scientists, as we do, will find the ways to create a fuel cycle that is unified and we can deal with the waste. And clearly we have safer and greater capacity in fourth generation modular units. So the solutions are there. And I just want, I want to leave you with just one thought, big thought about this, which is what excites me and why I'm banging away at this. We've got to move rapidly if we're gonna save some of those islands. We have to be able to turn this around. And that means we're gonna to have to embrace very forward-leaning policies very quickly. And next year in Paris, uh, in December, we will meet all of our nations of the world in order to try to set targets in order to be able to do what I just talked about. Well, let me just tell you something. We could produce, we're not about to, but we could produce three times the entire electricity needs of the United States of America well into the future from 100 square miles down in the New Mexico, Colorado, Arizona region. You could do it if you decided to. We could do solar thermal, we could do other things, but we have to build the infrastructure to do these kinds of things. We have to invest in it. And that is true all around the world where people have yet to embrace the simplest forms of energy efficiency, where we could be making a different set of choices about how you price carbon and what you do. The bottom line is this. 
the marketplace that made America richer than it ever imagined in the 1990s was a one trillion dollar market with four with what uh, one billion users one and one one bit one trillion dollars market one billion users every single income earner in america every quintile of our percentage of taxpayers from the bottom 20 percent to the top saw their incomes go up during the course of the 1990s we created more wealth in america because of one sector of our economy the technology sector that boomed and it provided goods to those one billion people and became a one trillion dollar market well guess what the energy market that I am talking about today, as you look at it, is a six trillion dollar market with four to five billion users, and it's gonna go up to nine billion users by 2050. It's the mother of all markets. It's the greatest opportunity to build infrastructure, build power plants that are clean, build windmills, build alternatives, to have a whole new restructuring of the goods and services that are provided to people that provide the energy of the world. And given the fact that almost half of the world still lives on about $2 a day and a huge percentage on $1 a day, the capacity for this development to change lives, save lives, reduce conflict, have an impact on security, change our ability to dream about a different kind of future is absolutely extraordinary. So. You know, it's a beautiful evening. You came here to have fun. I don't want to go on and on tonight, but I'm just telling you. There is a solution staring us in the face, and the Pacific region, the Pacific Islands, can help to underscore to people what is really at stake. It's called life itself. And the irony, the horrible fact is, those nations most threatened are those nations least contributing to this problem. So the developed world has an obligation to make this happen, and I look forward to working with our Kiwi friends and others and all of the Pacific Islands. We're going to get this job done. Thank you for Pacific Day. Thank you for watching. Thank you very much. Washington to celebrate Pacific Day. Uh, firstly, can I begin by acknowledging Secretary Kerry. Can we thank you, sir, for your uh, remarkable leadership around the world, your global leadership uh, in countries from Ukraine to Iraq, from Afghanistan to the Middle East. Uh, your leadership and President Obama's leadership and the leadership of the United States is working hard to make the world a safer place and we acknowledge uh, all the great things that you do, and we look forward to uh, our discussions over the next couple of days. I'd like to uh, also pay tribute to our ambassador, Mike Moore, and the team here in Washington, who work very hard to represent New Zealand's interests uh, here in the United States, and thank them for all the things uh, that they do. The Secretary made, uh, of course, uh, absolutely the right point. Uh, there are lots of challenges in the Pacific, but also lots of opportunities. It's a part of the world that the United States and New Zealand know well. We have a shared history together and there are many initiatives that we work on together. When I uh, first became Prime Minister at the end of 2008, one of the core decisions that the government made was that it would reorientate its aid towards the Pacific. 
and now half of all of New Zealand's aid goes to the Pacific Islands. The reason for that was because the Pacific is family to New Zealand. Uh, if you look at Auckland, that is the largest Pacific city in the world. Last week I was in Samoa and Tonga and Niue. So just to give you a little sense of what those numbers look like, when we went to the rock in Niue, there are roughly 1,500 Nueans living on the rock. There are 23,000 Nueans living in Auckland and around New Zealand. When we went to Samoa, there's about 180,000 Samoans in Samoa. There's 150,000 New Zealanders of Samoan ethnicity. So New Zealand understands the Pacific well, and uh, it has a very uh, deep history and a, a great affection of the people of the Pacific. The Secretary made absolutely the right point, that some of the issues in the Pacific are both easy to identify uh, and present great opportunity. Last year, New Zealand was very uh, pleased to be able to lead a conference about renewable energy. And as a result of that conference, over $600 million was pledged to initiatives of renewable energy, many of which will be rolled out in the Pacific. To give you one example, we uh, are instrumental in, in helping fund uh, the UN conference for SIDS in Samoa. And the facilities that are being used are the facilities that the old Pacific Games were held in. And so as part of that, the, the roof of the stadium and the various gyms there have been covered in solar panels to ensure that the conference is uh, fully renewable and in fact there's a renewable source of energy. In Tonga, a number of initiatives that we've undertaken will see that country go from having 0% of its energy coming from renewable sources to 30%. And that is um, of great economic advantage to the people of the Pacific. Uh, but also as a great way of them demonstrating themselves that even for some of the smallest countries in the world, uh, they are making sure that they're doing everything they can to reduce their carbon footprint. So there's a lot to be done. Um, around economic development, we know the areas of fishing and others are critically important. And again, we'll continue to work with the United States on those areas and areas of aid development. You've come to see the entertainment and to enjoy the the warmth of the Pacific, so I'm not going to speak too long, but I just want to make uh, two final points if I can. Uh, the first of them is that uh, New Zealand's had a long history of sending people to the United States uh, for education at some of the Ivy League universities here in the US. <coughs> We've been doing that since 1922. And many of them have been funded under a program called uh, Harkness. So for some time now it's been uh, a little dormant and we haven't been sending people to the US, uh, but under the leadership of the Chief Executive of the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet, Andrew Kibblewhite, who's with me on, on this trip, we have gone away to the other departments to tell them we think it's a great idea for them to give us some seed capital. And as a result of that they've found a few million dollars we're putting into a capital fund. And starting next year we intend to uh, ensure that the Harkness Foundation is alive and well and sending two people to the United States every year uh, to attend the Ivy League universities that you have uh, from Harvard through to MIT, uh, from Berkeley to Stanford and to Yale. One of those will at least come from the public service and you're probably aware that very recently we announced a ambassador for economic development for the Pacific, Shane Jones, who is a former member of parliament Shane himself went as part of the Harkness uh, Foundation and studied at Harvard University at the Kennedy School of Government. So at least one will come from uh, the public service and another one will come from almost certainly the private sector. So it's a great, uh, a great way of uh, continuing our, our links with uh, the uh, very impressive levels of higher education here in the United States. And lastly, can I, can I just say that uh, we've been in New York New Zealand's working very hard to get its place uh, on the Security Council for 2015-16 uh, for a vote that will take place obviously in October of this year. We're up against uh, very strong competition in the form of Turkey and Spain. Uh, but in the course of the last 48 hours we've had some incredibly productive meetings. Uh, we've met with a variety of different groups 
And I think New Zealand is a small country, uh, but a country with an independent foreign policy is a proud voice, a consistent history, and one that stands up for what is right, uh, is the right sort of country to elect to the Security Council. We were last on the council in 1993-1994, and I don't think it overstates things to say that it was New Zealand that argued very strongly for the people of Rwanda and Somalia, and it was New Zealand that helped ensure uh, that action was taken uh, for those people. So this is uh, an important trip for us. We're looking forward to our time over the next 48 hours. We've got a pretty busy schedule, and we'll finish, obviously, with an opportunity uh, to see the President in the Oval Office uh, on Friday afternoon. So that's enough for me tonight. Uh, make sure you enjoy the festivities and the evening. Uh, we have been remarking, as, as we've been in New York, about uh, the ability of teams in the World Cup, of which you, Mr Secretary, have won, and we in New Zealand do not. <laughs> so at least that hasn't been a point of contention working against us as we've been uh, looking for places on the Security Council. We're not offending anyone with our performance in the World Cup because we're not there. <laughs> but come down uh, and see us in 2015 for the game of cricket and we'll be doing that. And of course we are the home of the Rugby World Cup and come 2015 in London, England, you can be sure those mighty All Blacks will be there performing as indeed will the great nations of the Pacific from Samoa to Tonga, the countries that set New Zealand alight uh, with great fans and uh, great, uh, great atmosphere as we hosted the World Cup uh, in 2011. Ladies and gentlemen, have a great evening. Thanks for joining me.